reveals more about our priorities than almost anything else. Rashi, a great Jewish commentator, explained what it meant to love the Lord with all your might. He stated it'd be just as accurate to say with all your money. For we sometimes find a man whose money is dear to him than life. So that was his comment. So um, benefits of freedom in our finances, okay? Now that we're, we're free in our finances, <coughs> that uh, we can give, okay? Talk a little bit about we, giving activates the principle of sowing and reaping. When we give, it activates that principle. Um, giving is an act of faith. I mentioned that earlier, but I was going to say it again, 2 Corinthians 9 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having sufficiency in all things may have abundance for every good work. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. What was that? That's 2 Corinthians 9 8. That you would have sufficiency in all things, including money, ma money matters. Um, God's able to extend his grace to us so that in all things, at all times, we will have all that we need. Now, I shared this when I started last week, and, and it was just mentioned in Suzanne mentioned again. Uh, I want to sort of repeat this over again. There's never no diminishing with God, even an economic downturn or recession. Mm -hmm. There's no diminishing with God. That's really important that we get that in our heads and, and our, our goes deep into our inner person, into our hearts. There is never any diminishing with God in any kind of economy. So we serve a God. So you know, the economies be like this up and down. It depends what part of the country you're in. Okay? And, and it's not good in this part. It's maybe better in another part. But from a God perspective, there's no diminishing. There's no shortage. So we're believers in Jesus Christ. We connect to the one that has all supply. Amen. There's no lack with God. We connect to that. God, you see the need that I have for whatever. You see the need, and God, I'm believing you for this need in my life. I'm believing you for that. Okay? It's a need, it's not a want, and you, you believe God that he will work things out. And God has ways to supernaturally work things out. You know, I've just seen over and over in my life how God has blessed and worked things out. Amazingly. In the area of finance and money, you know, and, and I don't want to talk about myself too much, but I just, I want to say, in my life, I've proved God. Mm -hmm. I've proved God in the area of how he can bless and, and how he can multiply. And um, it's exciting. You know, really, you know, we talked about tithe earlier, but, you know, if, if, um, if we choose not to tithe, we're actually saying to God, God, you're really not owner of everything. We're really saying that. And, and we're saying, God, I can't trust you uh, and your word regarding me giving money and paying tithes and offerings. I can't really trust you. Well, can we trust God or can't we? Yeah. You know, we often have that decision. I can trust God that he will do supernatural <coughs> things for me as I'm faithful in areas. The motive for giving reveals the character of the giver more than the gift itself. Um, we, when we have freedom in our finances, you know what? We can save. When we have freedom, we can save. Mm -hmm. uh, savings plan. Learning to live on less than what we earn keeps us from overindulging. Okay? We're all subject to overindulging. Probably not one of us are, you know, there's a part of us that we can overindulge. Um, and the saving plan helps become financially, uh, or we don't uh, spend financially, we're not irresponsible in our finances. The excuse of rationale for lack of saving from Christians mm -hmm. is that God will provide our needs. Okay, that's what they were, they take that verse, God will supply all my needs, according to riches and glory. God truly is our provider. 
which is exactly why we need to be the best stewards and savers that we can with our money. So let me say this. If you're earning money and, and you're spending it and you have floating dollars and you spend all those floating dollars, whatever you do, and you have loans, whatever, you know what? Yeah. I think that you're not being a good steward of your money. That's what I think. When you're a good steward of your money and you've disciplined yourself and done the things that you know that you need to do, then you can say, God, you will supply all my needs according to your riches. Only then. See, so, you know, we might be, our financial world might be in a mess, but God supply my needs. No, no. If you're not disciplining yourself in areas that you need to discipline yourself, don't think that God's going to supply all your needs. Because he gave you 3000 or whatever per month, but what did you do with it? You know, we, we have to ask that ourselves. We don't have someone else come and ask. We're going to ask ourselves, what did I do with that money? You know? Um, you know, we t I talked about the budget, but I think as well, every time you spend, you write it down. I have a sheet that goes under food, that goes household items, whatever. I write it down every time I buy something. At the end of the month, I have exactly where all the money has gone. Okay, I do that. That's good. You, don't, you know, I hear, I see people and they, uh, the clerk says, do you want the receipt? No, they don't. I'm like, <clears throat> what are you keeping track of? I think, to myself, what are you keeping track of? You know, you're just letting it come and go. But, but I think that we just, we're really careful in those areas. So God will supply your need if we're good stewards. If we're not good stewards, we can't expect his provision. Um, we save for our future. Um, you know, we, we need money for, for emergencies. We need short-term savings for household vacations. Um, we need long-term savings for looking toward investment and retirement. I would say savings is a habit that is ingrained even in the smallest of creatures. For instance, the ant is a saver. You know, we can learn a lot from the ants. Proverbs 6, uh, 6 to 8 says, Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from the, their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer gathering food for the winter. That's the ant and they are really busy creatures. We save so that we can succeed. Planning ahead financially guarantees that we can reach our goals. Saving and planning ahead will put us much further ahead <coughs> than leaving it to chance. <coughs> leaving our finances to chance just does not work out. Proverbs 21.5 says, the plans of the diligent surely lead to advantage. Okay, the plans of the diligent leads to advantage, leads to blessing, leads to prosperity. Uh, but everyone who is hasty comes sure, surely to poverty. You know, I kind of touched on this last week, but I don't think we make quick decisions uh, in the stuff we buy. We should not make quick decisions. I talked about that last week. So, you know what? Uh, and I say to couples, you know, like, and, and they're kind of, they're not the same page when it comes to buying something. I said, well, you know what? You talk about it tonight, you know what you do? You pray about it to you pray and you don't have agendas. Next week you sit down and talk about it to you come into one. Here's what we should buy. You know, and maybe then once you come to agree what you should buy, you save money totally so you have, can buy it for cash, whatever that is. You know, when you're buying for cash, so there's no debt, there's no interest on it. You, you wait till you get it. <clears throat> and we don't need all this stuff. <clears throat> you know, if you're a couple <clears throat> And you just in love with each other, you know what? If you go to bed at the little table, you can manage, you can sit on the floor. Who cares? Because the things that are important to you got. You know, rather than say what well, we do need a, something in our living room. So we're gonna save really hard. We're gonna cut from the whatever to get whatever it is you want in your living room. You know, and you know, I would say again, and it's just what you probably want to maybe get new, but there's so many things you can go to garage sales if you need it in the home as you're starting out, especially for young couples, and you can paint and you can fix it up, and it's really nice, mm -hmm. you know, and, and saves you a lot of money. <clears throat> um, when we learn to live on less and set 
parts of our savings to give away, we better understand what the greatest investment really is in this world. Life is not just about money or possessions, but it's about caring for others and it's about evangelism, spreading the good news of salvation to lost people. That's what it's about. So it's about people. It's not about the things. I've said that several times, and I hope that just kind of weighs on you. If we're not faithful in saving, it's difficult to provide financial support to missions and ministries that we want to bless and see thrive. You know, again, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Um, <clears throat> um, it, we are to save money because it's a wise thing to do. The wisdom of Proverbs sums up the reason why we should save. Because it's an exit practice. When we save, we prepare for the future and succeed with plans that we have. Proverbs 21, 20 says, The wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. I just talked about the foolish man. We're spending all he gets. We don't spend everything that we get. Okay? I just want to say, when we follow God's principles, it relates to money, when we follow those principles mm -hmm. and work hard on them, we won't have lack, we only have potential. Okay? You know, and a lot of times, let's face it, we're guilty we have not followed God's principles in areas of money. You know, I can think of all the times of all the things I did that I shouldn't do. <clears throat> um, when we have freedom in our finances, we can give an inheritance to our children, and grandchildren. You know, it's sad, but I watched the journey of some people. Now, and, and, and some people never bought a house, so at the end of it, they never saved, so they get to the area of retirement, they, they get Kenda pension, which is me, girl, and they get Kenda pension. But you know what? They can't live in that. They're in poverty. They've got to live in some very poor dwelling that's government subsidized because they should have done things years ago. <clears throat> you know, I've said this, at least for a couple when they're young, mm -hmm. they buy a house. Mm -hmm. At the end of the journey, <coughs> if they paid it off, they at least have that amount of money as, an, as some investment. You know, a home that's worth $500,000 today, mm -hmm. 20, 30 years ago, is maybe worth 20000 25. So, you know, they've made a lot of money and they at least have that. <clears throat> but then there's some. I know of a couple, they kept doing this, it's really sad. But they kept putting, getting loans against their house. They had their house, and now this is not a young couple, they're now 60 years old, 60, 65. They now had taken pretty well all the equity out of the house. They ended up selling their house, they moved into the senior's place. He died a couple years ago. Now, she's all by herself. She doesn't have any money except what her pension does. All she's got. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because they weren't wise and proof way back when they should have been in, in following principles that bring prosperity to them. Mm -hmm. um, at, the, at the end of this journey, or our journey in this life, we're able to pass on inheritance to our children, our grandchildren, and charitable our organizations. Now, I find this very interesting. <clears throat> you know, a lot of, and if I have time, I'll talk more about some of this a little bit further on about wills, but you know what? I find that couples that do have an estate, you know what they do? They leave their estate to the children. So, you know, if, if the people are 70, 80, 90, and they leave it to the children, which is a property of 50 or 60, and so on, the 60-year-old probably doesn't need the money. You know who needs the money is the grandchild mm -hmm. that's 30 years old and is married and has two or three kids and they're trying to get established. It's the grandchildren, you know? And, and how many times we don't put the grandchildren in the will. But Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. children. Yeah. You know, in my wife and I's will, um, our kids get some money, but every grandkid gets a portion of our will. Mm -hmm. You know, they get a portion of it because you know what? They need it probably worse than our kids will need it. Plus, if our kids haven't been um, 
diligent in their money matters at 60 years old or 65 or whatever, they can think, you know what? Hopefully the grandchildren will, or at least the grandchildren have money as they're establishing family. So, you know, we need to include the grandchildren in the wills. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll talk a little about wills later on. Did the grandchildren know that they have to live? Pardon me? Did they, your grandchildren? My oldest you? grandson, I told him last spring, I said, you know what? Yeah. I want you to know that you're in the will. I said, we put, we, my <laughs> wife and I put all the grandchildren in the will. <laughs> he seemed quite happy that, that he was in our will. You know? <laughs> and I'm happy that he is in the will. You know, he's the eldest grandchild and um, that, so. Wow. So, perspective. There's three places our money will go when we die. Three places. To people we love, to charities we believe in, or to the government. There's three places where our money will go when we die. <coughs> None of us know how long we'll be here on this earth, but while we are, we want to live our lives to make a difference. We make a difference when we invest our time our abilities and money for kingdom purposes. We accumulate assets in life to allow us to live, to enjoy life, okay? to serve and give to others, and to leave a legacy. Those, uh, why we accumulate assets for those things, and to enjoy life. You know, I'm sidetracked a little bit, but I think whatever age you are, you need to enjoy the journey of life. You know, if you're a 20 year old in this room tonight, you need to enjoy the journey of life. If you're 30, you need to enjoy the journey of life. And how that would unfold for you. You know, and I, I hear this, and it's really sad. I hear some say, it's only 20 years and I can retire, or 15. You know, and so if someone looks at, in 15 years, whatever, I can retire. And, then the missus and I, we will just live, enjoy life, we'll get a motor home, we'll travel the country. Mm -hmm. you know, let me say two things I observed. One thing is, sometimes they both, both are not living the time that person retires. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. one, one has passed away. Mm -hmm. The other times is, and I've seen this, and they've said, you know, so that they did get to the, let's suppose they're 65, and they did retire, they bought the motor home. You know, after one year of traveling all through the country, now what? Now what? <laughs> now what? Now what? Now what? We've done that. You know? So, if you're a Christian, now you can serve kingdom purposes. Yeah. Okay? If, if you're a Christian, you can serve kingdom purposes. Um, Jesus told us to store up treasures in heaven. Matthew 6, 10 to 20. One day death will foreclose in everything we own in this life. Everything will you know, for close. Um, as a Christian, we must ask ourselves, what will last forever that I have? What will last forever? How can I use earthly wealth for eternal purposes? Yes, mm -hmm. says, how can I use wealth for eternal purposes? Um, so I'm going to kind of move in now a little bit to uh, when do we need an estate plan? Uh, first of all, let me say 60% of Canadians do not have a will. 60% don't have a will. If they die, you know, the government comes in and the government gets a good chunk and there's a trustee that's appointed and the trustee gets money. You know what? What they work for is vastly disappearing. Um, so uh, we need a, a plan, a will, an estate plan when we have start having a few assets. And when we have kids, it's really important. When I'm talking to couples, I go through pre marriage with them, I said, you know what? You might not have much, but when you have your first child, you better get a will. Because you know what? If something happens to two of you, who gets your child? You, unless you have it in your will, you know what? And there's, there's family members that couldn't have kids and want a kid, they'll fight over the kid, and if they can't make a decision, you know what? The public trustee says it will go in foster care and here's where it will go. You don't want that to happen. So I said, you need a will saying, look, in an event that we both pass away, that our child or children, these will be our caregivers. My wife and I, when our kids were like eight or 10 or maybe a little bit older, we said to them, if something happened to my wife and I, who would you like to be caregivers for you until you were 18? They both named the same aunt and uncle. 
So mm -hmm. we talked to him and said, look, are you agreeable that we could put you in our will in the event that we were killed, that you look after the kids? And they agreed. So our kids knew, you know what, that gave them peace of mind. If something happened to us, they would go to live with this aunt and uncle who they really liked and appreciated. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are important things. Um, an estate plan lays out how, to whom, and when our assets will be divided upon death. It's a great feeling when we know our estate um, planning will reflect our values when given to individuals and organizations in the right way. Having an estate plan, a will, okay, will reflect our faith and our values. Will reduce taxes and fees at death. Will help to promote harmony in, in the family. And will hopefully avoid conflict over family assets heirlooms and expectations. You know, there's so much fighting over wills. I can't tell you, I just see it over and over again. You know what, someone dies, mm -hmm. and they're be thankful for what they are getting. They're fighting over the money. Mm -hmm. That's a joke. Yeah. So, I think, how sad that is. But if you, the better you have it written down, um, there's less chance. I believe that the benefits of an estate plan should go beyond our spouse and children. The following needs to be considered uh, in making a will. I talked to you about the grandchildren. They need to be considered. Ministries and charities need to be considered. Okay, they're important to us. Um, only 4% of Canadians give to charity in the will. Only 4% give to charity. That's not very many, 4%. Um, and, and I want to say this. I think that our local church should be on the list of charities. Charities, I really do. You know, if you're given to charity, which I think is good that, and if you've been part of a church for 10, 20, 30 years, I think that <coughs> you need to bless back. They've blessed you and ministers that you received over the last 10, 20, 30 years. Now you need to include that, that you can bless them and they can take that money and further the gospel with it. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, no estate plan, suggestions for getting started, set a deadline, okay? We all know how life can get away, get in the way of something like this. Plan to have it done by six months or one calendar year from now. Become knowledgeable. I'm going to say, if you're going to start, if you don't have a estate plan, don't have a will, become knowledgeable. You can be educated from the, of the basics of the estate planning on your own, um, rather than a lawyer and get the information and give it to you. You know, you can go online and get much good information about establishing an estate and things you do. So, or you can read books. There's so much you can get. And then once you've studied that, um, that's one thing. And the other thing is you need to organize your financial information. You need to list all your assets, the home, other real estate you have, your car, bonds, mutual funds, uh, savings, jewelry, coin collections, antiques, whatever you have, you need to list them. Okay? And you need to determine their market value. Um, is there any indebtedness over all the things that you have as far as assets? Or are they all clear? Um, your, our estate lawyer will work with the information that we give him or her, so it's important that the information is complete so they can work with that. We need to make a list of all the people and organizations we want to receive from our inheritance, for our spouse, our children, our grandchildren, etc., and include their full legal names, date of birth, current address, and how they relate it to you. Name the charities and their addresses you wish to give to. It's so important. That, that's detail. You know, a lot of times people do things up and they don't detail. They don't even detail uh, address for, for their, even their grandchildren or, or they want to give this charity. They don't detail the address or that. It's so important that it's all detail. Think about how and when we want these people and organization to inherit from us. Is the full inheritance distributed immediately upon death? Okay, is it? Is it installments to avoid irresponsible spending? You know, I think sometimes it all depends if, if you had two children or three children, 
and one is irresponsible, you might want to have that estate released proportionally, that they don't receive the whole chunk of money. You know, it's been really, really sad. I, I've just watched where people got money from inheritance, and they, they, I think they went through it. I know this one guy, he received this inheritance. You know what he did? He went out and bought a plane. Yeah. You know? I said, I didn't know his parents that well, but I think, uh, you know what, I just can't believe you did that. You know, and I'm not sure how long you had to play, but you know what, I just think, if your kids that you leave the money to aren't responsible, then maybe they have a system of how that's dispersed. Um, and they don't get the lump sum. But of course, for children or, or grandchildren, uh, money that would need to be held in trust. Your question? Yeah, exactly. I was going to just mention that uh, a good idea probably is to create a trust instead, for especially for like beneficiaries who are um, underage, yeah, and those who are like, you know, not capable of spending the money well. Then creating a trust would answer that question. Like, if you can definitely direct a trust and how to s to disperse of uh, the estate. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, so it goes in trust, and and so proportionally they get the money. Yes. Yeah, it's one of the nice too. Like you know, like um, I've seen where the calculations, you know, where you divide the money and everything. That um, they have like when the government pay tax, you know, on on the you know, on the on came from the will, and the way it reaches out for three people or somehow like that, where you get more more money per kids or whatever, because of the um, government, um, you, you subsidize <coughs> the taxes that have to be paid on that, like the money that you get from from the um, well, and then goes back and um, that it pays more for your kids or whatever. He's talking about a probate uh, I process. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just like you pay a lot of money <laughs> to the government if your if your uh, inheritance goes to the estate. So instead of doing that, one one way could be you know directly to putting a beneficiary to your to your um, property. Yeah. To avoid yeah. estate, to avoid estate and probate. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Isn't I'm that beneficiary is enough time having this statement? What's that? Beneficiary. When you state the beneficiary in your bank account and everything, isn't that enough? Well, let's suppose you just had money in a bank account, you didn't have any assets. And let's suppose you had two kids, mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't need someone to probate your will then. The money would just. Split it between. Oh. And I know someone that did this, they had, all they did, they didn't have any. Anything other than just liquid cash. And what they did is they, they had investment certificates and they made one out for, it was in their name yeah. and, and the child's name, okay? And it was for each of the kids. So upon the death of that individual, each one of the kids automatically had that certificate, okay? And it was really simple, it didn't cost money to finish off. It, it, it definitely will, will, uh, it will, it will not go to estate instead. So yeah. creating a beneficiary to your bank account, mm -hmm. for example, a tax free savings account or RSP, if you have a beneficiary in it, it doesn't go to estate, so you don't pay taxes for it. Mm -hmm. Your beneficiary will, but it goes directly to them. It doesn't go to like the whole process of probate. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're just, you're sharing something that's really good. I was going to, um, and that's really good. Um, I had some of my notes. I'll maybe just jump ahead and can find that. Yeah, and it just it's along the line. Um, registered assets, you're, you're talking about this. Registered assets can be passed to a surviving spouse without tax. In the absence of one, the assets be added into income, generating a very large tax liability against the estate. Okay. Now, however, the Canadian government allows a charity to be named as a beneficiary of registered accounts. An individual can leave their R RSPs, and some of you would have RSPs. You could leave that to a charity, okay, or a, a RIF, R R I F, the RIF, to charity on, upon the death. And by doing so, you effectively wipe out the entire tax liability and the charity's benefit. Okay, so it's really important. So, you know, let's suppose <coughs> your state, you want to give, say, 40% to a charity. You could take those kind of things and um, you could have them register a charity. 
and it saves tax. And that's really important, because you know what? You work really hard, and at the very end of the journey, you don't want your money to be diluted, you know, and especially when you can give into the kingdom of God. I just think, you know, to give to good charities is really a very honorable thing to do. Um, uh, think about who you want to be the executor. The individual uh, would be someone we trust and have good judgment. So who do you want for an executor of your will? Um, uh, if we have children, we need to decide on who we want to be our guardians. Okay, I've talked about that. Uh, um, we need to think about whom we would want to, about whom we would want to make health care decisions if we were unable to do so. We need to write down our thoughts and questions as we go along, so that we will remember to discuss them with the lawyer. An experienced lawyer will be able to guide us with these decisions, but he or she does not know. Um, our families like we do. Give it advanced thought to these matters and will help our lawyers draw up the right estate plan. So keep in mind that a estate plan is a process and we take several meetings with our lawyers to get things the way we want them. We also need to update our estate plan from time to time. That situation change. So consider this for a moment. Uh, you're in your twenties, you're a single guy, you don't or a single gal, you don't have a will. But you get married, you're in your 20s, and maybe you buy a house. So you, you as a young couple, you decide now that you're going to, you need a will. Because you've got a house and maybe have a child or two, which is a good idea. So you, you have the, the will drawn up. Okay, as you go on, and uh, that, uh, as time goes on, you will uh, find that, you know, um, maybe now when you get say. 50, you're now 50 years old, or 55 to say, things are changing. Now your kids are getting married, there's grandchildren. So you want to keep updating your will and how it reflects. You know, like sometimes couples do the will in their 20s and they never change it. Mm -hmm. So in a time a couple is 55, from their 20s to 55, a lot of things have changed. So where do the kids come in the picture? You know, and if they're 55, maybe they even have a couple of grandchildren. Where do the grandchildren come in the picture? And by then, they would even think, where are the charities? Or who are the charities that we want to bless upon in our estate? You know, that's all things that um, you need to think about too. So keep updating the wheel is really important. Um, so does the executor need to be changed? If an executor lives a, a thousand miles away, it's more difficult to attend the estate. Also, is the executor still in good health? Does he or she desire to be left as the ex executor? You know, those are things. Do you need to change the executor? Um, you know, and I just want to finish off and then I have questions on anything we've talked about. But sustainable giving, you know, again, I just think you know, that um, what we do with our money is very important. 90% of the average average person's assets are in the form of cash, okay? And over 90% of all donations to charity are in forms of cash. Good estate planning with a stewardship focus can release resources so they can be used to sustain charitable work for years to come. You know, if the Christian community would all include, if they would, I mean, they have the right to do whatever they want, if they would include a charity, at least one charity, in their estate plan, can you imagine the impact that would have on charities? It's big, it's really big, you know, but a lot of times that doesn't happen. Good estate planning with a stewardship focus can release resources that can be used to sustain to char charitable work for years to come. Um, most Canadians are interested in giving from their estates if presented with the opportunity and guidance on how to do it. You know, and, and I would say this, I think that Bigger churches especially ought to have an hour, hour and a half where they talk about estate planning. Mm -hmm. And churches need to talk about that. Uh, so first of all, it gives guidance to the people in the church. And, and, uh, and even it helps those people realize if they're part of that local church, that local church probably needs to be on there. And, and mm -hmm. who are good you know, charities to give to? I just think that that's good. You know, a lot of times, People struggle. They don't know what to do when it comes to the area of their state and how do they plan it and what do they do. 
Um, so giving our estate, giving through our estate can allow us to give a donation much larger than we may have been able to uh, during a lifetime, okay? We wouldn't have given it, but on, on money in our estate, we can give a large donation to RSP or whatever. Um, and we can help ministries, which is really a wonderful thing to do. So, um, freedom, finance, freedom in our finances gives us peace of mind, it gives us freedom financially, it's, it, we secure financial our future, freedom to give to ministries, free to give to others, free to give to the poor. Now, I don't have any more in my notes, so I guess we'll have time for questions on anything about finance. And you can come and disagree with me on something I've said in the last um, last week and this week. If you want to disagree, you have to freaking do so. <laughs> you got to have a, a biblical base for doing it. Yes? Um, about uh, giving to poor. Yeah. Uh, you spoke about if somebody comes to you and knock on the window, I'm hungry and you eat since morning or I'm homeless. You may give me a couple of dollars or coins that I can eat. You say that. Yeah, you know, I just, I always said we need to be careful about that. I think a lot of times we feel sorry for those people, and that's really good that we have compassion toward them. But just because of compassion toward them, you know, we need to kind of be a little discerning. Uh, is, is a mind giving wisely. I, I know a man in Regina and, and he would go to many different churches and he was living with a woman and they had a baby and he would come to the church and he said I need milk for money and diapers. Now are you as a church, are you not going to give money to someone where they need it for milk and diapers? But the problem is he didn't do it just to our church. He did it to 20 churches. He needed, so he got a lot of money for milk and diapers. <laughs> he, 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 you know, he, he, was, he was playing the system. Those are the kind of people we don't want to be giving to. Yeah. So, so we worked it. You know, uh, <clears throat> that we just would not give him uh, money for milk and diapers because we found out what he was doing. So I think we check in, even if someone, a poor person's come to church, we can check it out, you know? Uh, not everyone that's crying poor is necessarily poor. They're just using the system, you know? And uh, I, I know another lady that uh, she, she got social assistance and she had, um, and she was older, I think she was a senior, but she would go and she, she'd get enough money for social assistance for us. Her, her apartment and the, the buy food, she get a food allowance. But then she would go around, she'd go to food banks and get vegetables and she'd try to get money from churches. Like, you know what? She's using the system. You know what? And we don't want to, you know, we can be a Christian, but let's not be a sucker. You know, let's not be suckers. Let's not, be, you know, Bible talks, be diligent with, in business, be diligent with our money. <coughs> Being diligent is not given to those people that are using us. You know, so, I think there's times that, you know, God would say to you, look, at, see that person? Mm -hmm. You are to give them some money. Yeah. But just one other story. You know, this I was going to have lunch with a guy in, in China. And then um, uh, this guy comes and said, I just got off the bus from Cologne and I haven't eaten for two days. Would you give me a few dollars to get some tea? I said, I tell you what, you come in this restaurant and I said, I'll buy you. Mm -hmm. I'll buy you lunch. Mm -hmm. No, 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 he said. I couldn't go in that fancy place. I think. You're not very hungry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you just, you want to use me, so I know you're not getting any money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, so those are things that we need to be prudent on. You know, I did, I've talked about giving to the poor. I think, as individuals, I, like I said earlier, we need to give to the poor. That we, we're lending to the Lord, we're giving to the Lord, and we give to the poor, and so do churches. Just need to do more, I think, in poor. So, yes. Personally, yeah, I have the, you know, the giving part. I'm forgiving. I'm a big time forgiving. In my country, I'm from the Yeah. 
Christian organization, they paralyze the whole nation there. Paralyze them. What's the word you're using? Paralyze. Paralyze. Paralyzing. Paralyzing. Paralyzing all the people there. Right, okay. So what happened now? They go there, they keep giving money to the people. Give them clothes, give them food. And now, everything, they don't want to work anymore. <laughs> so, are they doing a good job? Because God tells them to feed the poor. Is it a good way to do it? Well, you know, it's interesting. I would say that's not good. You know, I think everyone needs to work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so you know what? I think organizations that give money, you know, like it, it kind of comes back to this. Yeah. Do you give a guy a fish or do you teach him to fish? That's right. You need to teach him to fish so that he can be sustainable. That's more important. And I think sometimes organizations don't teach them to fish, they keep giving them the fish, yes. and that's not the answer. They need to teach them to fish. That's right. So if we went to countries and we teach people how to make money, maybe it's gardening mm -hmm. and selling Sewing. produce. Sewing. Sewing, you know, or in some countries, it's gathering wood and selling wood. There's, there's many things that we need, to, we need to work there. So I think sometimes in charitable organizations, we haven't done right by what we do. That's, that's right. pretty good. That's why I'm talking about me. I'm really mad with them right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they do more wrong than good. Yeah. I would be agree with it if they put it to resources to help the people to be independent, not to keep giving, giving, and then the person keep getting, getting, and then they have a mentality of dependency yeah. permanently. Yeah. So in this, it, I believe we are doing more damage if we are giving in that manner, yeah, you know, so because we have that problem there now, right now, because Haiti usually a fertile land. They import everything from overseas now. In Haiti, they don't want to work the land, and then they just want to receive things that ready made. Yeah, from American, from uh, whatever Canada, they expect now because of what Christian organizations are doing. There's ever a sense of entitlement. Yes, sense of entitlement. <coughs> Which is not good. I blame the Christian. Yeah, yeah those, are, those are very real problems. How do you address them? Yeah. You know, like, um, I, I said this. You don't not give someone welfare if they really need it. But if a, if a guy's on welfare, then he needs to be working at something. If it's no more than taking a broom and sweeping the street or whatever, yeah. You know, we as a city, we should find jobs for people on welfare. And if you want welfare, you got to do this. Maybe it's, maybe it's painting a, a building or whatever it is. We create opportunities so you just throw something. Well, you know what? Uh, it's uh, first of October. I'm going to go on welfare till springtime. You know, and we support people like that. That's that's using the system. Yeah. And I'm all against people using the system. Yeah. <clears throat> so what you said is how to give efficiently. Really. Yeah. Not to give for to eat food and then go to the bathroom and then come back again. You know, how to give efficiently to build a person like eventually be on their own. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So how you would like to, to do that? So you know, I just wanna say this <coughs> that organization I think you need to in a very loving way give some strong words to them. Yeah. And say, look, I don't want to support an organization that's doing this. I want to support an organization that teaches something to fish not just keep giving them fish. Yes. That's good. And maybe if they don't change, maybe you just say, God, what charitable organization do I give money to that's going to handle it in a different way? You know, uh, <clears throat> you know, I just want to say, and this is really tough, in Istanbul, uh, they have some people that get money, have little kids go and beg on the street. They sit on the sidewalk, and here's, here's like a six-year-old, and they're sitting there. And they got a container, you know, it breaks my heart. I could hardly walk by those kids. I just, there's more than I could handle. But the parents had put their kids out on the street to beg for money. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think how they were using kids yeah. to do that. How yeah. sad that was. Very sad, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Yes? How 
important is that really much, or is it like almost like a form of unbelief that? Yeah, I, I, I want to give a couple thoughts on insurance, and then anyone here can, can share their thoughts. Here's what I believe, <clears throat> and I've given couples pre-marriage counseling. I say when you have kids, you need some kind of insurance from now to when the kids are 20 years old. So if something happened to the husband, the wife has money there without stress to raise the kids. But I say this, and this is cheap, and no insurance salesman will sell you this kind of insurance. Reducing term, <coughs> reduce, reducing term is really cheap. So let's suppose you've got $500,000 of reducing term. In 20 years, when the kids are, are 20 years old, that term deposits nothing. So all it is is protection. So it's 400,000 today with two little kids, you've got two and four year old, you've got 400,000. But every year keeps reducing. So if the kids are 12 and something happened to the husband, now there's probably only 225,000 in there, which helps bridge the gap. You know, so that's what I say, that's the kind of insurance we have. I've seen, here's the other thing I've seen, is couples get married and then they start having kids, and an insurance salesman comes along, and they oversell couples insurance, and couples are making payments of $125 a month insurance. Mm -hmm. I think, just a minute. And then you know what happens, here's the thing, they make payments for five years, 125 times five years, and then guess what they do? They drop it. I think yeah. they just wasted all that money, yeah. you know. So I I always say reducing term. You, it starts out and it's it's way cheap. Straight life costs you a whole lot more money, because what happens twenty years from now is still worth four hundred thousand. So it costs you a lot more money. But reducing term. So basically, if a couple are twenty years old and they take a twenty year reducing term, the chances of them dying from twenty to forty are pretty remote. Okay, now they could get killed in cars, and, but they would die of a heart attack or, or probably cancer. You know, those things are very remote. So insurance companies know the risk for them is very low, and that's why insurance is really cheap. So anyone can add if you insurance. Yes, go ahead. So, so basically insurance does, they have a lot of functions that you can use for. For example, yeah. that for, for um, what Ernie has already mentioned, so you can actually use that for protection for your kids when in the event that both of you dies or like it's like having a common disaster clause in your um, like trust or estate or will. So at least that insurance would cover for their needs because they can't really take care of their needs just because they're young. But then you can also use an insurance to build actually an inheritance for your kids and grandkids. So part of estate planning could be an insurance. So that's part of, um, there's a lot of uh, uses for insurance. Like to me, I don't think insurance are bad. It's just like people are not using it properly. So it depends on what your needs are. Um, like there are, for example, mortgage insurance, uh, for example. Uh, there are a lot of people who are actually buying mortgage insurance, which is good because in the event uh, something happens to you, it pays mm -hmm. for your mortgage. But you can actually buy a cheaper one like a personal insurance, like a term insurance maybe, like a 20, 25 year term mm -hmm. for cheaper price. And in that effect, your, the value of that insurance doesn't diminish over time. So it's still, for example, you buy $500,000 insurance, you have a $500,000 mortgage for 25 years. Uh, if you buy it uh, with the bank, then this becomes less and less because your mortgage is lower, say after 10 years. But here, 10 years after, your 500,000 is still 500,000. So, you know, you have to wait the way, you, you know, which is gonna be best for you. There's a lot of uh, things I can, <laughs> I can discuss about it, really like that. It's part of financial planning, it's part of estate planning as well, so um, there's a lot of benefit to it. I just yeah, want okay, to, thank you. I just wanna ask you about the insurance. Um, uh, according to our beliefs, you say about insurance. Yeah, that's what, that's saying, what we yeah. were saying. Yeah. Um, whether we like it or not, the system put us into it. We are doing it anyways. We're paying car insurance. Mm -hmm. So why not pass the inheritance to your, your, your children? Mm -hmm. And which one are you going to choose? The, the term or life that's according to your assets that you have to. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying. 
Yeah, again, being good stewards of the money God gives us, you know, what's being a good steward? Yes. Mm -hmm. a, good, a, a good way to really identify what your needs are according yes. to studies, you only need uh, times, you actually, you actually need 10 times the amount of your annual uh, salary to provide for your uh, beneficiaries when you, in the event that you die, because that would, that would be the amount of time that they would need to recover from your loss. So if you're like, if you're earning $50,000, Annually, you probably would need only five hundred thousand, nothing more than that. Then you're overinsuring yourself. Now you're paying for more. You're actually diminishing your uh, your power to you know do something else with your money. Wasting money. Yeah, you're wasting money at that point. Yeah. yeah. The the worst thing is to do is you far would have a little less and make sure you keep it, mm -hmm. than than get too much and drop it. Because I've seen numbers of cases where couples drop it and think you paid in this for this many years and now you drop it like. Yeah. You should have taken less out and kept with it, you know. Or buy a whole life insurance, because that will be a fixed term. Yeah. Then you stop paying after that term. Yeah. This will happen. Okay, let's pray. Thanks for your input. Father, we just uh, thank you for this evening. And Lord, I just pray things that uh, are biblically sound from your word. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help individuals in this room that want to move for, to financial freedom that they could know the place of being totally free in their finances, totally free. Lord, I pray that you give them wisdom. I pray that you guide them. And Father, that you would help in these areas. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you all.